I've got a question for you, you, Esther, you actually. Um, we've got, at least in our department, I'm sure in many others, a large group of people of very different skill sets, lots of whom don't have English as a first language. Yeah. Um, and I worry about um, the use of moral injury terminology to describe something that they're all experiencing, but yeah. they might not understand or might turn away from because at least at first glance, it means nothing to them. How do you think we can get around that? So I think what really attracted me to the concept, first of all, was that it explained something that was a harm that happened to people that wasn't their fault. So a, a lot of people have said, yeah, but why is it an injury? What are you talking about people being injured? You can't say that. I said, but people get injured at work all the time. What are you talking about? It's, uh, I'm only talking about the psychological you know, terminology for that. Um, and I am quite wedded to the words, not just because that's you know, where, where the, what the idea is, but because I think they're useful in describing that uh, it's your sense of what the world is has been harmed because of something that happened, in this case, in the workplace, say. Um, so there isn't a sort of quick way to say it. Uh, and even moral injury isn't a quick way to say it because you've got to explain what it is. But, but it's really, it is really important, I think, to foster conversations within and across teams and within and across cultural groups, say, uh, to say, we have all, every human, got some kind of understanding of what the world is. And it is really usual to feel very upset if that's disrupted by events like accidents or terror attacks or pandemics or whatever. And I think there's something about giving permission, isn't there? And I don't know what this is like. But but the easiest thing to do, I think, is to get people together and let them tell you. Because they do, if you can create a bit of warmth in the room. It's difficult, isn't it, when we're all a bit physically distant. But you'd be surprised what people come out with and then someone else will say, yeah, exactly this, you know. So the first thing it takes is courage. And that feels like it's a decision that you make in the moment, but it isn't actually. It's a, you're going to need to keep that courage with you. And to know that if somebody becomes distressed, you've probably seen distress before and you were probably okay last time you saw it. You, maybe you saw it in a patient, maybe you've seen it in a family member and you have got through it, right? And you will get through this. And you know yourself if they become so terribly distressed that they're completely inconsolable and you think this isn't gonna be just self-limiting mm. crying. You know where to get help from you need to know where to signpost to and if you've got a duty of care for this person, who you're going to report on to. So if they start talking about suicide or self-harm, you need to know that you can do the next thing mm. with them. Because if they can tell you those sorts of things, as hard as it is to hear, that's fantastic. Mm. Because then we know. And when we're acutely distressed or depressed, and when somebody says, what do you need? The answer is often like just for this to stop. And of course, it's not with anybody else's gift. So you're right, it is really hard to know mm. what people need. Perhaps if maybe we know them a bit already. Maybe we're going to put boundaries around them and say, it's really hard for us to identify what you need right now because you're very, very distressed or depressed. I'm going to phone you tomorrow at X time and check in with you and we're going to talk again. Or maybe you're able to see them or you can video call them. Tell people what the plan is, what's going to happen next. Remind them that you're not going away because the biggest fear that we have as humans mm. is that when we are at our lowest or our most distraught, that other people can't handle it and that they will leave us alone. Yeah. Even when we tell them to leave us alone. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so <laughs> by not leaving them alone, you're doing a huge thing for someone and never underestimate the power of listening. There's a supportive thing we do for students. Listening in itself is an intervention, just to be able to hear, especially if they're telling you something that to them is so taboo, you mm -hmm. know. If you can hear it, they're not alone. They're really, really not alone in that moment. Mm. So do you, do you feel that within your working setting, you would know, so if somebody came to you in really sort of terrible distress, would you know where to ask for further help for them, do you think? 
I think so. We have I've got two very supportive managers, um, very supportive matron, PGN, and everyone is very close, uh, but not close enough where it would be awkward to yeah. say I'm having trouble with this, that or the other or I'm worried about someone else. So yeah. I do feel like we do have a very um, a supportive network within my within my unit, um, which I know we're very lucky for, but we have um, been offered quite a lot of wellness sessions nice. um, for us, for the staff. Yeah. We're not, we're unable to meet sort of face yeah. to face for a lot of them because yeah. of the pandemic. Um, so it kind of feels a bit, um, Unpersonal, mm. um, sort of speaking to someone over a camera. Mm. Just for me personally, I find talking in a group a lot harder than yeah. talking one to one to someone. Yeah. So it's a bit hard to, you know, if you're really having problems within yourself, to tell a group of people. It's a lot, a lot easier to tell one person yeah. rather than lots of people. And also because um, I know the other people that would be in the group, so you know, yeah. you might feel a bit embarrassed from the way you're feeling. Yeah, um, absolutely. And there's probably no shame in it, but it's just the way it's just the way you feel. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think? Do you find that that there are people that you could talk to, say, if you needed to? Is there a person that you? Yeah. Could, yeah. Yeah. Great. Definitely. Good. Good. I'm glad. I think that it's interesting. You sort of say, you know, when it, when it's people that you know. One of our really big problems when we get down or, or very distressed in other ways is that the idea of being seen, okay, to kind of fall apart. But of course, we, we do see, other people do see it because we all pick up on one another because we're built that way. Um, and I think with mental health, we're really rubbish at reminding people, everybody, that people can become unwell, really quite unwell, and then get better. Yeah. We really forget that part. We just go, oh, people become unwell. End of story. Yeah. And we need to remember people get better too. You know? Yeah. And sometimes when you're speaking to the same person or someone that you know, sometimes yeah. you almost feel like you're moaning rather than actually yeah. sort of letting go of that, that feeling. Yeah. You feel yes. like you're moaning or venting. And yeah. Sometimes and it can put a strain on the relationship yeah. because you yeah. might think, oh, she doesn't stop moaning, does she? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When really, like, that person might just need an outlet, just yeah. might need to just let it all out. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's difficult now, isn't it? Because there's so much, and we haven't all got in infinite capacity to mm. keep hearing it yeah. all the time. Exactly, because it is hard to listen to it all the oh, time, yeah. as well as, like, it is tiring. Um, yeah. It's just yeah. as hard um, expressing yeah. yourself all the time. Yeah, it is. So it sounds like you either have to observe existing environments where people either debrief themselves or, yeah. or, or talk to each other about what they're experiencing or create new environments for that to happen and for it to happen naturally. It's challenging um, and I'm sure it's the same in critical care um, because our, our staff groups of different seniorities all are not at equal risk but all can suffer moral injury and yet we're asking quite a lot of our leaders to, to supervise um, practice for other members of staff when they may be morally injured themselves. Yeah, and how yeah, far does yeah. the resource go is a real... That's right, yeah, so if everybody's not okay, then what do we kind of do? So I think one thing is really important to remember about our responsibility to one another is that it doesn't always have to be leaders. In fact, it ought not to be leaders who instigate all these conversations all the time. There's no reason why someone else at some other level can't do it. What you really need to have is just to be a good facilitator. And, and all that means is you're quite curious about people, you're able to encourage them to speak, and you can stop them being unkind to each other. So those qualities can be in anybody. I, I, I agree. I mean, it, it's sometimes difficult, especially if you're not used to a leadership position. And I know there'll be, there'll be people all over the country, all over the world, who are stepping up into new yeah. roles. Yeah, yeah. And I think if we model courage, though, to say, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. And you were talking about boundaries earlier, weren't you, Hannah? Just going, I'm not answering that text, or I had a word with myself and I'm not going to send that text. If we can model that kind of behaviour to everyone through our actions, like you don't have to say, here's what I'm doing, you just do it, um, then we support other people in doing it. We make it okay for them. 